Hello, and welcome to the Drug Discovery World podcast, a podcast covering topics around drug discovery and development, pharma and biotech. My name is Giles, and I'm here to take you through this episode. Today's episode is part two of a series of episodes titled Integrated Platform Drug Discovery and Development Companies. The article was written by Dr. Urban A. Kiernan and Dr. Stephen Naylor. So now on to the main article, Integrated Platform Drug Discovery and Development Companies, Part 2. Integrated Platform Drug Discovery and Development Company, Moderna Therapeutics. Moderna Therapeutics, originally called Mode RNA, was founded in 2010 by Derek Rossi, Harvard University, Kenneth Chin, Harvard University, Robert Langer, MIT, and Nubar Fayan, flagship ventures, flagship pioneering. In 2011, the company recruited Stefan Bansell away from Biomeria to become CEO. Moderna operated in stealth mode for the first two years of operation, and most analysts mistakenly believed it was a stem cell therapeutic company. As the company removed its invisibility cloak, it became clear that the Cambridge MA-based entity was actually developing messenger RNA, mRNA therapeutics. In addition, it had already raised $40 million, led by flagship ventures pioneering and a host of private investors. History and Evolution of Moderna Nubar Fayan has always thought expansively and chased challenges most conservative investors avoid. The idea of being able to instruct a patient's own cells to create therapeutic proteins and antibodies to fight off all types of disease indications could change the drug discovery and development paradigm. So, the stated original visionary goal of Moderna Therapeutics was to use mRNA therapeutics to treat diseases such as diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and certain viral infections. Secrecy, Money, and Valuation The early years of Moderna were shrouded in secrecy and some degree of uncertainty. An articulated bold vision now had to be reduced to practice, and in order to execute on the plan, monies had to be raised. The initial phase of such efforts followed a two-prong approach of federal grant funding and more classical offering of services to large pharma, in return for upfront as well as back-end loaded payments. In terms of grant efforts, the company raised $24.6 million dollars in the form of a grant provided by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, in October 2013. The funds were provided in order to develop an mRNA drug technology to fight infectious disease. Subsequently, Moderna received a grant from the USA Department of Health and Human Services, Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, BADA, for $125 million dollars to develop mRNA-based vaccine against the Zika virus in September 2016. The company also embarked, in parallel, on an aggressive service play to large pharma. In March 2013, Moderna signed an agreement with AstraZeneca to develop mRNA therapeutics in a variety of major disease conditions. The agreement included an eye-watering upfront payment of $240 million dollars one of the largest licensing deals made that did not include a drug already in clinical trials. This mega-deal was followed by an agreement with Alexion Pharmaceuticals in January 2014. It agreed to pay Moderna $125 million for 10 orphan disease drug products. In addition, Alexion made a $25 million preferred equity investment into Moderna. The company then announced a deal with Merck for the development of vaccines against viral diseases in January 2015. Merck made an upfront payment of $50 million, as well as a $50 million equity investment into the company. During 2016, Moderna expanded its deals with AstraZeneca, January, and Merck, January, as well as a new deal with Vertex, July. In the same year, in June, the company entered into a deal with Merck, $200 million upfront payment, to develop mRNA precision medicine vaccines to treat a number of different cancers. These relationships have continued to develop as candidate drugs have started to emerge, and a good example is the Moderna-AstraZeneca drug co-development deal signed in November 2017 for the mRNA treatment of heart disease. Drug candidate, 
AZD7970. Moderna also pursued an aggressive but stealth-like mode in seeking equity investments. As noted, Nubarfe, a flagship, had provided the initial seed funding of $40 million in December 2012. Flagship followed this up with another investment of $110 million in November 2013. Over the next three years, Moderna raised an astonishing $949 million in equity investment alone from a variety of sources, including pharmaceutical companies, institutional and private investors. All this occurred in the context that Moderna had no actual drug therapies on the market, and that the business model was still evolving. In spite of such uncertainty, lack of demonstrable progress, and no translation of discovery into products, the estimated valuation post-money after the $474 million investment in August 2016 was $2.974 billion. It appeared that secrecy could pay off if you have a talented management and advisory board team, and you have framed your potential product or products, mRNA therapeutics, in an exciting and paradigm-shifting new light. Problems and uncertainty Any company that had a record of secrecy, along with an evolving business model, as well as an ability to expeditiously raise significant equity investments, write successful federal grants, and generate substantial service-based revenues could be expected to have growing pains. In an attempt to peek behind the Moderna curtain of secrecy, Damien Gade noted in a scathing commentary written in 2016 that the company's caustic work environment has for years driven away top talent and that behind its obsession with secrecy, there are signs Moderna has run into roadblocks with its most ambitious projects. The most pointed criticism was levelled at Stefan Bansel, the CEO of the company. Apart from the usual character flaw issues such as ego, assertive control and impatience, the most pointed complaint was that company valuation was the dominant force driving company function, and not the science. This led to a toxic work environment that resulted in high management and staff turnover, which is rather unusual in well-funded early-stage companies. Additional complaints levelled at the company included the fact that a focus on vaccines was short-sighted, and even more damning was the fact that the company had published no data supporting its claims to produce mRNA therapeutics. Gade quoted an anonymous former employee of the company that appeared to capture the essence felt by many at the time, namely that it's a case of the emperor's new clothes, they are running an investment firm, and then hopefully it also develops a drug that's successful. In addition to personnel issues, there was also the problem of a still uncertain and evolving business model. Early in the life of the company, a venture unit was conceived that was responsible for the creation of new subsidiary companies associated with mRNA therapies in distinct disease indication areas. These companies were initially wholly owned subsidiaries, complete with their own management teams. This organisational structure was designed to facilitate a Moderna push forward on a multitude of therapy fronts simultaneously, while attempting to mitigate risk but maximise reward. The companies were Onkaido LLC, formed January 14, 2014, responsible for mRNA therapies in oncology. Valera LLC, formed January 2015, responsible for the development of mRNA products for the prevention of infectious diseases. Epidera LLC, formed May 2015, responsible for mRNA treatments in rare diseases, and Caperna LLC, formed October 2015, responsible for precision cancer vaccines. Unfortunately, this model never fully materialised, and the company announced in September 2017 that it was shutting down all four subsidiaries and subsuming drug candidates back into the parent company. Bansell explained that potential new investors struggled to understand what they owned versus existing investors. He went on to explain that internally, because of this organisational structure, R&D efforts were being duplicated, and the additional complexity had led to higher and unnecessary expenditures. This reorganisation proved costly, and left a continued concern that bringing everything back into parent Moderna may stretch the company too thin. Finally, both Bansell, the CEO, and Hogue, president, provided an optimistic perspective by stating, the benefits of having everything under their control 
outweigh the risks of managing several separate subsidiaries. Unveiling the platform. Moderna had, in four short years, between 2011 and 15, raised considerable investment funds, and some notoriety. The secrecy surrounding details of the platform and suggestions by former employees that the company had not published any data supporting its ability to produce mRNA therapeutics gave cause for concern. In particular, a comparison to the scandal-plagued blood diagnostics company Theranos was inevitable, since unnerving parallels were becoming obvious. Moderna had shared almost no details in the peer-reviewed literature concerning its platform, and even the targets of drug candidates in phase 1 clinical trials had not been revealed. Investors appeared to be operating on a blind faith basis as to the underlying value of the platform. In spite of high management and staff turnover which had plagued the company, by 2015, Moderna had achieved unicorn status. Such status brought additional scrutiny and potential scepticism as to whether promises made would be ultimately realised. Something clearly had to be done. Moderna mRNA Platform In early 2017, Moderna disclosed its first drug candidates, which included vaccines for both flu and the Zika virus, as well as treatments for heart failure, at the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference. It also agreed to provide unprecedented access to reporters from the journal Science, to Moderna research facilities, and details of the mRNA platform. The Moderna scientific premise was elegantly simple but profound. Introduce a specific, modified mRNA into a patient such that this single-stranded molecule, drug, starts to produce proteins, utilising human cells in the patient to produce a corresponding protein. It has been compellingly argued that assembling these chemical instructions could be a faster and more adaptable way to make drugs than manufacturing the individual proteins themselves in large bioreactors. And it would allow scientists to deliver proteins that act inside cells or span their membranes, which are a challenge to introduce from the outside. An mRNA drug would also be easier to control than traditional gene therapy. The elegance of the idea was undeniable but the practicalities of implementation were immense. One major issue faced by Moderna was that mRNA is subject to degradation when introduced into the human body, along with a myriad of other significant hurdles. In order for the process to work, the mRNA has to avoid degradation, enter the patient's cells, and be translated into a specific protein, as determined by the computer code of the mRNA-based sequence. In order to overcome these difficulties, Moderna had built an mRNA molecular platform that consisted of the following. 1. Delivery. mRNA is formulated in a lipid nanoparticle which acts as the delivery vehicle. 2. Avoid immune system. One of the mRNA bases, typically uridine, is chemically modified. This prevents activation of immune receptors that detect foreign RNA and destroy it. 3. Enhance protein production. The order and frequency of modified RNA bases affect how mRNA folds and controls the efficiency of the ribosome to produce larger quantities of the specific protein. And four, targeting correct cell. Other regions of the mRNA are modified to target specific cell types. The Moderna platform consists of a variety of sophisticated chemistries, including nanoparticle chemistry and mRNA design algorithms, and of course, the output of molecular mRNA therapies. Cervic has written much more expansively about the platform, and additional descriptive detail can be found in the abundant patent filings of the company. Finally, in April 2017, Moderna announced positive interim data from a phase 1 clinical trial. A double-blind, placebo-controlled dose escalation study in 31 patients demonstrated induced high levels of immunogenicity for its mRNA vaccine mRNA-1440, against avian H10N8 influenza. These results were the first data that, in effect, validated the Moderna mRNA platform. Platform and Reality We have discussed that pharmaceutical companies struggled with TTP implementation and integration into their drug discovery and development process. The lack of understanding of technology development, the THC, Technology assimilation and TICS curves 
was a pronounced contributory factor to a lack of any significant increase in drug discovery and development productivity by pharmaceutical companies over the past two decades. Thus, it was both startling and refreshing to read that in 2017, Dr. Melissa Moore, CSO of mRNA platform development at Moderna, mused about the Gartner THC. Where on this curve, she wondered, was their Moderna technology? The concern was that if the trough of disillusionment was ahead, then it threatened to be deep. The conclusions that Moore and senior management came to about the THC in regard to a PD3 company like Moderna were both surprising and enlightening. The company had been increasingly aware of the secrecy label and the potential damage being done to Moderna. Management pushed back and argued that detailed disclosure did indeed exist in the form of patents filed and issued, and that controlled release of information had clearly not hindered their ability to raise monies and amass a considerable war chest of financial resources. Moore suggested that wealth and secrecy may be protective. In addition, she said, you don't have to ride up and down the Gartner's hype curve if you can work through the biggest setbacks before the public ever sees them. She concluded that, we've had failures, we've gone down blind alleys, but because we've been quiet about it, nobody's seen that. That's why I think we're going to end up on the slope of enlightenment without passing the trough of disillusionment. Do these thought-provoking comments suggest that this may become the model of how to implement a PD3 approach when employing a concerted, nuanced, but clear understanding of technology development, THC, technology assimilation, and TIC S-curves? Valuation and Platform Drug Discovery and Development Numar Fayan was recently interviewed, June 2018, on WBUR, a public radio station in Boston, about his views on drug discovery and development, as well as Moderna Therapeutics. Dr. Fayan was, as usual, thoughtful, insightful, and provocative. In particular, he clearly articulated the changing paradigm of drug discovery and development associated with a PD3 approach. He stated, I'd say the one big shift that we've seen is that people are making this less of a bet on a single drug and more of a bet on a platform which can produce many drugs. All of our companies, flagship pioneering, have decided that the way to innovate and create new products in this field is not by betting on a drug, but to bet on a platform that can generate many. And in that regard, those companies require a lot more capital, but also provide a lot more opportunity for reward than the single bet that used to be the biotech companies of the past. Afayan suggested also that due to the complex structure of the Moderna PD3 approach, it is more appropriate to think of Moderna not as one company, but as an assemblage of five or ten different companies. If you look at how many drugs they have in the clinic, it is about ten times more than most other biotech companies at this stage. Such assertions strongly suggest that PD3 strategies can help facilitate increased valuation of such companies. Although, it should not be overlooked that Moderna does now possess a robust mRNA drug discovery and development pipeline in prophylactic and cancer vaccines, immuno-oncology, regenerative, and systematic therapeutics. This consists of 21 mRNA drug candidates in preclinical, phase 1 trials, and phase 2 trials. However, the company still does not have any successful products currently on the market in patients. The authors believe that the valuation of Moderna dramatically increased from 2.5 billion up to 7.5 billion pre-money, mostly in part due to the platform capabilities. The pre-money valuation of Moderna was estimated at $2.5 billion in August 2016. This was followed in early 2017 by the company highlighting the component parts of the platform, followed shortly thereafter by validation of the platform. The subsequent valuation of the company skyrocketed to $7.5 billion. Coincidence or a reality-based phenomenon of PD3 companies? Moderna Therapeutics has experienced a roller coaster ride since its formation eight years ago. It has enjoyed meteoric financial success in association with a plague of criticism. The company has clearly articulated the potential of its mRNA platform and has developed the beginnings of an early stage but burgeoning pipeline of drug candidates. In return, investors have rewarded the company with a staggering valuation. 
Some have argued that such evaluation is unsustainable. The authors are not so sceptical. Moderna has clearly demonstrated the power of its PD3 capabilities and has set new standards for valuation considerations. However, they would also note that the current board and management team members have demonstrated an ability to define new paradigms as well as learn from past mistakes. In the latter case, this is epitomized by the change behavior of CEO Stefan Bansel. Back in 2016, he was the focus of a highly critical article predicated on a series of issues associated with Moderna. And last year, he was voted an EY Entrepreneur of the Year, and Moderna was voted in the top 25 best places to work in the Cambridge area. All of this combines to suggest an IPO is on the near horizon for Moderna Therapeutics. Conclusions The pharmaceutical sector failed to adequately implement TTPs into the drug discovery and development process. This has led to a stagnation of productivity as defined by flat annual FDA NME NTB approvals. In part, this was due to a lack of understanding on how to optimize the choice of which technology or platform should be selected. More recently, a number of companies, including Moderna Therapeutics, have defined a new paradigm associated with the co-development of the PD3 model. It could be that indeed we were right in our 2007 assertion that a more focused and integrated implementation of TTPs should result in a significantly improved output of therapeutic drug products. We simply picked the wrong implementers. Moderna and others have demonstrated that the implementation of a PD3 approach can significantly drive company valuation. The initial case studies appear to suggest that, in good part, this is fueled by an innovative and validated platform. Although the complexities of such efforts should not be underestimated, and an experienced and flexible management team is a vital necessity in order to produce drug candidates that fill the company pipeline, it is clear that the new paradigm, driven by PD3 efforts, is here to stay. The unresolved question is can such an approach finally drive the drug discovery and development process out of the mire it has been stuck in for several decades? For example, is the uptick in productivity for 2017 just a part of the annual yo-yo effects of NDA BLA filings and NME NTB approvals? Or are PD3 efforts starting to have an impact? Only time will tell. This article was written by Dr. Urban A. Kiernan and Dr. Stephen Naylor, and we're going through their bios at the end of this series of episodes. Following on in this episode series, Integrated Platform Drug Discovery and Development Companies, we'll be giving a comparative analysis. If you've enjoyed this episode, then you can subscribe to Drug Discovery World free of charge by visiting our website at ddw-online.com where you can also view all of our articles, including references and images, and download the original PDFs. The links are in the show notes. If you're enjoying the podcast, then we'd really appreciate a minute of your time to leave us a review, and you can also follow us on social media on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you for listening, and we'll hope to see you in our next episode.